Well, let's go ahead and and get started. And people kind of continue to come in. Uh, welcome everyone um, to our monthly simulation uh, special interest group lecture. Um, we're honored to have Dr. Alexander Collis um, from the Department of General Internal Medicine uh, giving the lecture today. And um, she's the director of our Medicine Transition to Residency course, which is a great course um, that prepares our medical students for entering their residency. Um, that's an important transition. Um, also serves as the director of Internal Medicine Internal uh, rapid response simulation curriculum for training our interns to respond to um, emergency situations. And that's uh, Dr. Collis's uh, focus in simulation. And she recently received funding from our WISA, our WISH Innovations in Simulation and Simulation Award for work looking at the efficacy of a smartphone rapid response application. And so Dr. Collis, um, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thanks so much, Dr. Sweet. I really appreciate the introduction. I'm excited to be here today to speak about our project. Um, I'm going to go ahead and screen share. All right. So I'm going to, like Dr. Sweet said, I'm going to talk today about the work that we did over the last year examining the efficacy of the Occam Rapid, Resp the rapid Response Toolkit using simulation. Um, and the research team for this project was myself, um, Dr. Vince Reichel, who's a general internal medicine hospitalist at the VA, um, Joseph Bell, who's a fourth year medical student who's been working on this throughout his time in medical school. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to be here tonight because he's interviewing for anesthesia residency. Um, Dr. David Karabaum, who's an associate professor of pulmonary and critical care sleep medicine at Harborview Medical Center. Um, Dr. Vic Roach, who you all know well, uh, research assistant professor for the Division of Healthcare Simulation Science, and Dr. Eliza Rosenman, who's an associate professor um, in emergency medicine. And as Dr. Sweet mentioned, I'm really grateful that this work was funded by the WISA um, Award last year for 2022 to 2023. I'm really grateful to Mr. and Mrs. Thayer for uh, the ability to fund this award. Um, otherwise, we have no financial disclosures. So a little bit of background. Um, rapid responses are a clinical deterioration that happens in the inpatient setting. And as you can imagine, the appropriate Timely and appropriate management of rapid responses is really critical to the, the care of our patients. Unfortunately, in the academic setting, a lot of times rapid responses are run by residents who may lack the uh, needed experience, knowledge, and skills. And it's a realistic situation that you have a first day intern show up as the first person to respond to a decompensating patient and be responsible for managing their care. So in a situation like this, when the needed like the responsibility and leadership skills far outweigh the knowledge that an individual might have, cognitive aids can be helpful. And literature supports this. Um, there's a fair amount of literature examining physical cognitive aids like booklets, uh, chess lists um, to help in situations like this. And there's a lot of evidence to support it. Um, there's also some evidence exploring digital cognitive aids, which you can imagine might be helpful in a situation like this. So we're thinking of things like a mobile application. Um, you know, in a situation where you're in an urgent situation, we need point of point of care support, something like a mobile app can be really helpful. But the literature is really mixed and the efficacy of these digital cognitive aids are heavily dependent on their design. Um, a lot of the literature to date examines um, the cognitive aid compared to nothing, like a control group with nothing, as opposed to looking at how the cognitive aid compares to readily available resources like UpToDate, Micromedics, Google. So it's really hard to get a good idea of how the cognitive aids would perform in real life when there are other resources available. So because of this, because of all of this and the need that we knew that our residents had during rapid response events, we created the rapid response toolkit within Occam. So for those of you that are unfamiliar, um, Occam, which stands for the Online Clinical Care Advisories and Messages, is a platform, a web and mobile platform that's available throughout the UW system and was in existence prior to this project. Um, it contains other toolkits like an antibiotic reference kit, which is probably one people will be uh, most familiar with, and then a trauma toolkit, among others. Um, so in September 2021, we created and launched the Occam Rapid Response Toolkit. So the toolkit was really primarily intended for novice, novice providers or residents, you know, kind of like I mentioned, um, 
And when we designed it, we took a look at what were some of the successful designs in the literature to guide um, how we would design our toolkit, although there is really no set standard to date. The purpose of the toolkit was to provide immediate management cues for commonly encountered in hospital emergencies, to provide need to know drugs and doses, um, to aid on on the spot diagnostics, and then while doing all that, avoid more nuanced management that might mislead users and also avoid lots of text or material that might detract from those key points that we really wanted them to be able to find and use in real time. And then aside from the information that we included really for more novice providers, there's other resources that could be used by anyone of really any experience lever, level as well as nurses. Um, that includes things like ACLS cards. Um, we have lists of the emergency numbers within our hospital system that you can actually dial through the app. Um, we have lists with equipment use and location and then hospital policies. So I wanna take a couple of minutes just to explore the app, familiarize you with how it works. So this is just what the app would look like on your phone, the Occam reference kit. And then if we take a look at the rapid response toolkit itself, you can see it's organized like this. Um, so we have four main categories that things are broken down to, altered mental status, shock, respiratory distress, and arrhythmia. And we selected these four categories um, by reviewing the rapid responses that happened at North or at um, Montlake and Harborview from January to December, 2020. We took a look at all the rapid responses that occur and there's almost like 1200 at each hospital and categorized the reason for the calls and then decided on these four categories based on that. Um, additionally, we have cardiac arrest and that's where the ACLS cards are as well as equipment use and location. And then the emergency response teams where you can find those emergency response numbers. So looking at the application, I'm going to give you a little example of how most of the sections look. So if you were to collect or um, select shock, you can see it takes you to a section that has undifferentiated management and then different categories of shock followed by drugs and doses at the bottom. This is what most of the categories look like. If you were to select undifferentiated shock, you have some cues as to stabilize, focus history, focus physical exam, and labs. And each of those categories can either be expanded or collapsed. Um, and I want you to note too, under where it says stabilize, in addition to having drugs, doses, kind of very distinct um, pieces of information, we also wanted some management cues, like assess airway breathing circulation, give O2 ventilate, establish IV access, and then you can see it says call the rapid response. So what are the management cues you need? What resources do you need to activate? And what care teams do you need to activate? And um, most of the categories are gonna look like this. And then here's an example of the drugs and doses. Again, each of the categories contains one of these. Um, and the goal of the drugs and doses would be for the person that maybe doesn't already knows exactly what they're treating, knows how to treat it, they just can't remember the drug or the dose. So you can go directly to this category. And for example, this is for altered mental status. We have hypoglycemia, seizure, narcotic overdose, and the user can just expand that area and figure out exactly what the drug and dose is that they might need. So to study our toolkit, we looked at two specific scenarios that could occur, anaphylaxis and SVT. And I'll talk a little bit more about why we chose them in a moment. Um, but part of it was we wanted users to have to navigate within the toolkit so and deal with two disparate scenarios. So first, I'll show you what anaphylaxis looks like in our toolkit. So there's two ways you can access anaphylaxis. First, if you click on respiratory distress, which is going to be the most obvious way to get to it, um, we have respiratory distress, initial management, kind of like we had for shock, differential diagnosis, and then anaphylaxis. So it comes up pretty quickly. But then we also thought people might think anaphylactic shock and access it through shock. So we also embedded it within shock. And you could see here shock, undifferentiated management, several categories of shock, and then anaphylaxis, which probably most people won't access it that way, but we have it there because we want people to be able to find things. And we have a lot of information embedded in the app that's distributed in different categories like this, so that even if you don't know how to use our application, you'll be able to find the information that you need. So if you either go through respiratory distress or um, shock, you get to this anaphylaxis page, which includes initial management, further management, and anaphylaxis signs. Um, and we have some of those initial management cues like assess airway breathing circulation, give oxygen if needed, consider intubation for angioedema. But then very clearly there, we have the drug, epinephrine, 0.3 milligrams, IM, 
mid outer thigh, one milligram per milliliter. So providing all the information you would need in one place to dose the medication. And part of the reason the application is designed this way is when we looked at successful designs in the literature, there was kind of three main things that came up. One was branching, which you think of like a flow chart. Two was linear, which is more like a checklist. Do this, do this, do this, do this. And sampling, which provides key pieces of information in that are kind of isolated and easy to find. And there's evidence that sampling might be better. So this is kind of structured more in a sampling um, structure where you can look at this. If all you need to know is the drug dose, it's pretty easy to find that without feeling like you have to do a step-by-step. -step. And then again, we really wanted to have information appear multiple places within the application so that someone that's not familiar with it will still find it. So some other places that we embedded anaphylaxis dosing information, um, if you go under initial management of respiratory distress, impaired treatment quick hints. So this section was kind of intended to guide learners that have, or users that don't have a good diagnostic framework and might think, oh my gosh, what does wheezing mean? Kind of tells you to go ahead and do these things. If you hear inspiratory strider, page ENT, consider IMFE, consider intubation. Um, and then again, in the drugs and doses categories under both um, shock and respiratory distress, we have for respiratory distress, we have anaphylaxis with all the dosing information and under drugs for shock, again, epinephrine with all the um, dosing information. And then here's supraventricular tachycardia. Um, so again, we have this several places within the application, but if you go to the arrhythmia category, and then you click on narrow complex tachycardia, you click on regular, it'll give you the differential diagnosis for regular complex tachycardia. So sinus, tachycardia, SVT, AV, NRT, et cetera. And you can actually select SVT, click on it, and that rhythm strip will pop up. And as you can see, we have that also for things like atrial fibrillation, and then we had similar rhythm strips for our wide complex tachycardias. So our goal is that a novice provider that maybe isn't as familiar with what rhythm they're dealing with can click on this, compare it to the EKG or rhythm strip that they're seeing from the patient, and that will help with diagnostics. And then you can see under treatment, again, we have the drug, the dose, adenosine, six and then 12 milligrams, and then also some management cues, bagel maneuvers, page stat RN, EKG strip running, hook the patient up to a defibrillator. Um, and just for your awareness, if you were to go under undifferentiated tachycardia back on that left panel, it would take you to a step-by-step -step for how to identify what the rhythm is. You would eventually wind up on narrow complex tachycardia and it would take you to this SVT page. So again, another way that someone that isn't familiar with our app should potentially be able to navigate to the correct page. And I just wanna take a moment to shout out um, the medical student member of our team. This is Joseph Bell. Um, I, he unfortunately wasn't able to be here today because he's interviewing for anesthesia. Um, but I just want to highlight, he did a really incredible job being very thoughtful and creative in creating this application. Um, this whole project started as his summer research project as a first year medical student, and it's continued on to become this uh, simulation study. And then this is him presenting at um, the Society of Hospital Medicine Conference in 2022. So once we had built our application, we thought about how effective will it be? Um, and our hypothesis was that the rapid response toolkit would improve the performance of first year resident physicians during simulated care events. And to think about if it was effective, our primary outcome would be time to critical medication administration. And we define this as the time that all of the needed information to dose the medication was supplied. We also want to look at time to initial men mention of the medication. And then for secondary outcomes, we decided to look at a performance score. And this is relevant because just because someone doses something quicker doesn't mean that performance and the patient care is better. So we wanted to make sure we captured that as well. And then lastly, we wanted to look at usability of the application. So we completed a randomized control trial um, from November of 2020 to February of 2023. Um, we recruited First year residents from every residency at uh, UW, including pediatrics. And there's 123 total residencies. We just sent out emails and recruited from everyone. Um, we had two arms of the study our control arm and our interventional arm. And um, both, both arms participated in the simulation, which I'll describe in a moment. Um, but prior to the simulation, 
both treatment groups was, were given a steady owned cell phone, iPhone, and on the iPhone was a sign out on the patient, which you can see here. Um, every phone had Safari app and the up-to-date app on it. And um, the participants were told they could use any resources that they could access, like up-to-date, they could Google whatever they wanted on the app during the simulation. And then additionally, the intervention arm had access to the Occam Rapid Response Toolkit. And they were told they could choose to use it if they wanted, but they didn't have to. And then before we sent them into the room, right as we were starting the simulation, we um, screen recorded on the cell phone. So that meant that later we could go and we could look back and see exactly where they navigated to during the simulation. So at the start of the simulation, um, we gave them a prompt. We kind of, for the group with the toolkit, the only thing we did was just briefly explain the purpose of the application, but we did not give them any instruction on how to use it. Um, and actually, just to include this now, we surveyed um, the intervention residents that wound up using the toolkit, and almost none of them had actually used it before. So we didn't have any training for them. Um, so the premise of the simulation was we had an 18-year-old patient that could potentially be you know, seen in pediatrics or adult medicine. Um, they came into the hospital, developed anaphylaxis, and then once the anaphylaxis resolved, developed SVT. So this is the prompt that we read before they went into the room. You were the intern alone overnight and you were paged about a cross cover patient, Taylor Robinson. Taylor's an 18 year old woman with a recent history of several episodes of syncope that have not yet been worked up. She presented to the ED yesterday with lightheadedness and was found to have a UTI. She was started on ceftriaxone and narrowed to Bactrim this evening. You were paged to her bedside due to shortness of breath. You may now enter the room. So the flow of our simulation was the participant would enter the room the mannequin um, would, or the patient, um, would say that they felt short of breath, like their throat was closing up, tongue was swelling, lips were swelling, and they had a rash on their chest. The participant should then give 0.3 milligrams of IM epi, one milligram per milliliter concentration into the thigh. And once this was accomplished, the anaphylaxis resolved. If one or any of these steps were not completed, and 10 minutes had passed, uh, 10 minutes, then the nurse would go ahead and administer the IM epi, call that out to the participant, and anaphylaxis would resolve. Two minutes after resolution, the patient would start to say that they felt like their heart was racing. That point, telemetry would show was SVT, and then the participant would need to give adenosine somewhere between six and 12 milligrams once, and then that would work, and they would give another 12 milligrams of adenosine. Once those two steps had been completed, there'd be resolution of the SVT. If one or any of those steps had not been completed at 15 minutes, the simulation would end. Here's an image from one of our simulations. Um, so we completed these simulations at Montlake and Harborview. We had one participant per simulation. We used our uh, Simman mannequin. Um, we recorded all the simulations on video re audio record. Um, and we had one standardized participant that played a bedside nurse that really didn't supply any additional cues. And once we had crewed all these video recordings, our research team went back and assessed time to critical medication administration, as well as time to initial medication administration. So for the two simulations, anaphylaxis and SVT, we defined critical medication administration as when they had delivered all the pieces of information that would be needed to dose the medication. So for anaphylaxis, that was the drug, dose, route, concentration, and location. We chose these because these are the piece of information you would need to dose epinephrine and the dose of epinephrine and route and location you would use for anaphylaxis differs from the route location concentration that you would use for a code, like cardiac arrest. So we felt that this was an important differentiation. Um, interestingly too, there was a case at Harborview a couple weeks ago where epinephrine was dosed for anaphylaxis using IV, epi, the wrong dose, using the code dose epi. So this actually is a clinically important differentiation. And then for SVT, we included the drug, the dose for the first dose of the medication, and then the dose for the second dose of the medication. And our team went back, reviewed the videos, extracted these time points, um, and then uh, one of us reviewed all the time points, and then we, we um, the rest of the team broke them up. Uh, like divided them amongst themselves, but we did each time point in duplicate. 
And then next, we assessed a performance score. Um, so using expert opinion from our group, as well as some external review um, from various content experts, we came up with a performance score for each scenario. Um, I'm just going to show you the anaphylaxis one as an example. Um, but in addition to those medications, we really wanted to capture the management steps. So things like obtain vital signs, ask for events leading up to the rapid response, verbalizes the diagnosis, evaluates IV access, kind of those best practices to any rapid response and specific to these scenarios. Um, and then as you can see within that, we also had components of epi dose being correct or components of the drug, and then providing the details of the drug without prompting. Um, and I just wanna talk a little bit about that. So we decided to include the details of the drug without prompting because in a real life situation, if all those details of the drug are not bundled together and given all at once, it's possible either the drug dose is delayed or the drug is given too soon before all that information is there and then given incorrectly. Um, so our SVT performance checklists look very similar and also included the dosing and uh, details without prompting. And then we collected a system usability scale. Um, this is a validated checklist where 80 or above is good and 90 or above is excellent. And we just did this with the um, intervention group that had used the simulation or used the um, application during the simulation. So looking at the results, um, these this is the results of our population. Um, we wound up recruiting a total of 46 individuals Two had to be excluded for various reasons. Um, so we had a total of 44 uh, 55% uh, of those were internal medicine or internal medicine prelim year. Um, and then we had a scattering of other specialties that we recruited. Um, it was 22 in the intervention group and 22 in the control, co sorry, control group, and they're pretty much equally dispersed. Looking at the demographic data that we collected prior to the simulation, again, pretty equal distribution between the intervention control group um, and specifically, we asked about previous medical experience, medical simulation experience, previous experience working in healthcare, and the number of rapid responses, code blues, or other high acuity resuscitations they've participated in. As we felt this might skew the data one way or another, but they're pretty similar between groups. So looking at our time data. So we found a statistically significant different uh, decrease in time to complete medication administration for epinephrine during the anaphylaxis scenario and both doses of adenosine during the SVT scenario. And in addition to being statistically significant, if you look at the difference in minutes between the control and intervention groups, for epinephrine, it's almost three minutes. For the first dose of adenosine, it's almost four minutes. For the second dose of adenosine, it's almost 10 minutes. So not only is that statistically significant, but it's pretty clinically significant when you think about the time to treat someone that's critically ill. Those are pretty big differences. And then we looked at time to first mention the medication. And this was kind of interesting. The time to first mention of epinephrine was not different between the groups, although it was statistically significantly less in the intervention group compared to control for adenosine. And I think this is notable because epinephrine is kind of a commonly used medication for anaphylaxis. And probably most of our participants went into the simulation knowing that piece of information. So it's not that surprising that they had equal times to first recognizing they needed to give epinephrine. But even with that, the intervention group had all the information they needed to actually dose it a lot quicker than the control group. And then if we look at something like adenosine for SVT, that might be a drug the residents didn't really have in their back pocket the same way. So that might be why we saw the difference. And then looking at the performance score, we had a statistically significant increase in score for the anaphylaxis scenario um, for the intervention group compared to control and no difference with the SVT scenario, but a trend towards improvement. Um, and again, this, you know, is this is also kind of interesting because before we did this study, our research group actually hypothesized that performance scores might be worse in the intervention group because we thought, okay, they're going to use the app, they're going to get to the medication quicker, they might skip some of those management steps, or they're just so immersed in the application, they're going to miss those management steps. So the fact that we had somewhere between a neutral and positive effect when the application was surprising, 
and gave some credence to the efficacy of the application. And then looking at the system usability, um, so we had an average score of the, the um, intervention group that used the toolkit of 84, which is good. Um, we looked at the screen record data that we had and all but one of the participants in the intervention group were able to successfully navigate to anaphylaxis page and all but one were also able to successfully navigate to the SVT page. And this without any prior training or exposure to the application. And then on a five point Likert scale, we asked some survey questions after the simulation um, and the intervention group almost all found the toolkit to be very useful and almost all said the, they were very likely to use the toolkit again in the future. And then lastly, we asked all the participants to just volunteer what some of the resources they might use in a rapid response would be other than our toolkit. Um, majority of them said up to date or Google, and then there's an, uh, some of the other resources that they volunteered. So looking at everything, you know, our application, the use of our application led to a decreased time in delivery of critical medications compared to control. Um, there was no difference in the initial dosing of Appy, which I think just shows that our learners, there are some drugs that they come in with some amount of knowledge with, but even though they knew epinephrine was the correct drug to dose, they did not have all the information to dose it correctly. We had an improved performance for anaphylaxis, neutral performance, for SVT, which again, you know, we had concerns that potentially the technology would actually impair performance. And that's shared by a lot of the experts in the field um, in the literature, concern that while technology has a lot of benefits, we might just be giving people too much information that they won't be able to use well in real time will actually hinder performance. So the fact that the design of our application led to improved performance, I think speaks to the way that it was designed. And then we had good usability. Our participants were able to navigate within the application without any prior training. And this was unique from current studies. The majority of studies out there looking at digital cognitive aids provide significant training prior to testing. So this is one of the few times that we have an application that was usable and successful without any guidance. So there was kind of three takeaway points that I wanted to share. So I think the first is that we have a, de a successful design. We use some of those sampling techniques. And I think that it was our design that was a reason why we had the improved outcomes that we did. Um, and I think that our design, you know, even though uh, the Occam app is not widely available outside of UW, I think it serves as a really good framework for digital cognitive aids. Two, our um, toolkit was more effective than other readily available resources that our residents use during the simulation, like up to date, Google, Micrometics, et cetera. And most of the studies today do not compare their digital cognitive aids to other readily available resources. And uh, digital cognitive aid can be as successful as it is, but if it's not better than what we already have, it's not particularly useful. So ours was. And then lastly, our toolkit was usable and it was intuitive. I think that's another important thing that in a real life scenario, and we're dealing with mobile apps that might be widely distributed, someone should be able to pick it up and use it in real time without prior training, which our learners were. So we have some limitations. Um, we were not able to include all of the 123 specialties that are at our uh, GME residency program, um, but we did capture uh, about 12, just fair number. Um, we had a lot more internal medicine than everyone else, but I think this is also pretty representative of the type of residents that tend to respond to rapid responses. Obviously, anytime you're dealing with simulation, we have to make inference, uh, we have to infer that this would be applicable to real life, but we can't say for certain that that would be the case. Um, the other thing is, as you saw, we only had one member of the rapid response team along with the participant, which is our our bedside nurse, in real life, there'll be multiple people that come to a rapid response. So it is possible that in a larger team environment, we might've had different outcomes. And then lastly, we only looked at anaphylaxis and SVT. And we chose these specifically because we wanted to watch navigation within the application. We wanted to stress test two parts of the application, but it's very possible that had we chosen um, different topics for our simulation that we might've had different outcomes. Um, so I'll pause here for a moment uh, for any questions on the work that we did, and then I kind of want to talk about what our next steps are in this project.
I, anyone else have questions, comments? It's great, Alex. Um, I, I had some questions, um, a few of them. Uh, one is, uh, were the evaluators uh, blinded to the treatment versus the control? Yeah, thanks for asking that. Um, they were. Um, so we specifically, we gave, part of the reason we even gave the cell phones was so that you couldn't tell if they were using the application or not. And then it wound up being useful in other ways. Uh, but we also tried to position the camera so you couldn't see what was on the cell phone. So really when you're reviewing the recordings, you couldn't tell um, whether they were using it. And we also had the people evaluating not be the people starring in the simulation. So there would be some blinding. So so it's interesting, you know, looking at the other aids that are available. Um, so I'm trying to like understand her picture. So they come into the study. Again, they, they were given half of them were given this aid and say this one download this or put this on your app and on your phone but then the other folks did they understand they must know that they were evaluating the app right Correct. so there might be some bi it might be some bias towards in using it and then did the people that downloaded did they actually those that were in the control group did they all use the app or did they go somewhere else um, so we actually, we gave them our own cell phones. So it was already on there. Um, oh, okay. But, and it had everything we screen recorded. Um, but looking back, they all did use that. They didn't have to. Okay. Um, there was there was a couple circumstances where they didn't use it for a while. And we'd have to kind of actually quantify mm -hmm. what happened. But interestingly, they weren't performing the correct clinical actions. And then after failing on several times, opened the app. Okay. Um, but they all wound up using the app for each scenario. I'm curious because you asked them at the end what things that they would would potentially use. Since you traced it, do you know what they did use during the simulated codes? The other, those in the control group, or even those within the um, treatment group, if they might have used something different. I looked at what they used in the treatment group. We haven't explored the control group, and that's kind of next steps. Um, but the treatment group, mostly, I think it was up to date. And then just Google searches. Um, one of the one of the limitations study too is we only had the up to date app. We didn't have Micromedics. We didn't have some of the other things that they do commonly use. Although up to date was the most common. Um, but that was mostly in the treatment group. That's what they use. The control group we haven't explored yet. I just looked at a couple, and okay. it's just you watch. You have the data. It sounds like you have. You have the data exactly. Yeah, so Rob, um, I think this is the next round of coding and the next study question and the next paper, but not trying to cram it into this paper because I think there's enough here. Um, and I and they were told, so both both they had the same phone and they either had the app or didn't, but the intervention group was said, you know, they were told they could use any app on that phone. And so, yes, there was up to date and there was also just the internet that they could use. Um, and they knew that the Occam app was there um, and they were, to they were told they could choose what they wanted to use. Sure, sure. Interesting, that's great. Yeah. Um, so I know you're gonna transition. I mean, other people might have questions too. I don't mean to... I don't so much have a question since I'm part of this group, but yes. I, I was, as I was listening to you present, Alex, I, I think one thing we've talked about how we tested two of the scenarios so that the Occam app represents, but when one wants to look at the potential harm of technology, you know, one thing that one, we could do in the future, this would be way down the road, but what happens if someone ends up with a, um, a scenario that doesn't fit one of the buckets on the app? Like, is that where there's potential harm because we they get they get fixed because because it leads them to a diagnosis because it leads them to a treatment if what they're dealing with isn't represented um or there's some sort of exception how do they manage that and are they able to say up oh, this doesn't apply in this situation i need to back out of this app and that's a, another question we could consider exploring yeah that's a really good point how do they know when to kind of fail out of the app put it down and um, revert to other resources or whatever whatever their training is yeah, this is, I mean, it's a very focused study and it's, it looks very, very promising. I'd be a little careful when you're publishing this or presenting this out there in that there's one statement I think you made about comparing it to the other aids, because you really aren't comparing it to a specific one. It's not like you compared one versus the other, because there were so many other ones that they could do. So I, I just would, I would just phrase it a little bit differently in the manuscript or whatever, when you, when you, when you put it together. 
Yeah, that's a good point. It's more like comparing it to real world world conditions. Yeah, just yeah, to whatever is available rather than to specific because we don't know yet. Like you'd have to actually put it head to head against up to date or something like that to really say that. Um yeah, but this is I mean the other thing, I mean, just I'm thinking um it's just like people walking down down the hallway and they're in their phone and they bump into people. I mean, you're so they're gonna be on their looking at their phone. I mean, what happens if are you looking at hands free? things or more if they have to do chest compressions i mean I know there's a lot of people in the room so like one person could be doing that and the other but like if just to free you up if there's a way to free your hands up so you're not you know staring at your phone and you're looking at the patient more than the phone yeah it's true is that actually is it going to impede maybe I not think it minute. will but i just like as far as your future designs i could imagine thinking about something that doesn't require you to stop looking at the patient and looking at your phone rather than, and taking up a hand even, you know, there's things that those, those are disadvantages to any, you know, digital cognitive aid. If you have to then get physical or get, get in there. Yeah. That's a really good point. It'd be interesting to think about how else it could be presented. Um, I'll probably take this as an opportunity to talk about next steps then, because I would love to get um, thoughts from the group too. So just to kind of show you what the screen record and the videos look like. Um, so we screen recorded and the way we did it was we kind of put cues in right when we started the screen record in the video. So we could go back later and put them side to side and watch them in sync. So you can see here, like I'm holding up participant 48 and then on the screen, it says participant 38. Um, and then later you can see the participant is examining the patient. And at this point in time, she was looking at the anaphylaxis portion of the kit. Um, so we can, it's really nice to be able to see in real time what's happening, what are they looking at, what are they doing? Um, so we wanna take a look at patterns of use and navigation within the application, the relationship between where they wound up in the application and what page they reached and the clinical actions that occurred, and then how both groups are using other resources. Um, Problem is those are my ideas, but I don't have a great idea how to extract that data. And I, I'm sure there's other, I feel like there's a lot there and a lot of data we could capture, but I think we might need a computer engineer and app developer to help us figure that out. Um, and then the second thing, kind of like you were talking about that we want to take a look at is what's the actual impact of the using the toolkit on user patient interactions. So you know, is the fact that they're actually using the application, meaning they're not interacting with the patient much, which is one of the concerns you see over and over again in the literature. Um, so we want to review the video recordings again and actually track the time spent interacting with the patient versus looking at the iPhone. So I'd love to hear from the group. This feels like a very Crest-like question of, you know, how are some of the ways we can extrapolate this data and what other things should we, we be looking at? So a, a couple of thoughts. One is in recording what's going on in the room and the app itself. There, there are some relatively easy to use tools to basically record them synchronized at the same time. So you can see exactly what's going on in the phone and what's going on in the room in real time, so to speak. Uh, the other one, just reading that second comment, this is like, a, a prototypical app for using augmented reality in one form or the other with HoloLens or... Yeah, with, I was thinking the same thing. With the new Apple Vision thing that's coming out. Yeah. So you can really see the patient and information is floating in front of you. and You can pick and choose what you want to look at next. So in fact, that would be another interesting study to then... Uh, have two groups, one with the, the head mounted display of some type, the other one with the app, and then see uh, what changes. And so then you probably want to also record something like gaze tracking, et cetera, to see what, you know, to what extent are they paying attention to the patient and things like that. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thanks for sharing that methodology. I think it would be really interesting to see how that might change the interactions. Um, we actually, when we first started this project, we talked a little bit about eye tracking technology, I guess gaze tracking technology, but it's it was well beyond the financial scope of what we were doing um, at that moment. But it would be interesting to see 
how people are actually utilizing it. And on the patient side, I mean, I was thinking the same thing, David, about an like to to have you know Google Glass or something that's something that where you have you, you see through augmented um, reality. But as a patient, you know, you're sitting there and you're distressed and you're awake and having someone come out at you with goggles on would be just weird. That would just be strange. It's one I mean, thing like when when you know they're under anesthesia, like they don't see that, but. Um, because Google Glasses have been around for a while and they have just not made headway into yeah. the clinical space. And I do think part of it is like we tell patients, right, they're not allowed to record or in the clinical space. And when someone has this device on them, no one really knows what they're doing with it. And it feels potentially impersonal until it's just like widely used and accepted technology. It creeps like earbuds. <laughs> and are it's like... Also- It'd also be very hard to track from a video review. Are they looking at the patient or not? Because are they are they truly looking at the patient or are they looking at the words off on the side? And you may even need like the patient sitting there, you know, pressing a button, like looking at me, not looking at me, because they're going to be the only one who knows whether they're actually making eye contact. Right. It's another layer of technology that you have to establish and turn on and mount and all of that before you're able to even touch the patient. So if it's just on a phone, it's something in everybody's pocket. It's really accessible. They know how to use it. Um, that's going to save minutes potentially off of the whole procedure. Well, that that's almost like a secondary problem. We can prove that by using that, they get much better at responding and taking care of the patient. Then we can worry about how do we kind of don it much better. Uh, Rob, I was thinking that a lot of technology that Shlomi has to do performance assessment could actually be used around this, both to capture data, but also to maybe uh, display data. So Austin just sent a leak at, or a link. Uh, so then it'll look like a bunch of frat, bo- frat boys are coming at you with <laughs> with ray bands. <laughs> I was just I was just trying to note that uh, these tech glasses are getting pretty they are. slick now. To- where you might not notice that somebody is wearing these aren't AR glasses though these glasses just have um, touch and camera uh, capability but <clears throat> I think they're working pretty hard on it uh, it might not be too long until you get normal looking glasses that have some yeah. AR capability by, by the way, it'd be very appropriate that you dub to do something like that given that the hit lab came up with the very first head-mounted displays. Find the first real application that makes it really useful. Yeah, and I almost just thinking in a rapid response situation, you're in some ways, you know, we want to look at how this impacts the patient interaction, then also the, you know, potentially the patient's um, experience of the interaction. But it's almost secondary when someone's acutely decompensating. You just tell them what you're doing and then you take care of them. Um, so it is an interesting idea. Um, I'm curious too, you you brought up the idea of there's a, a program that you can use to synchronize the two. We can kind of manually synchronize them, but it would be helpful to be able to just watch them together and keep that recorded. What, um, what program is that? Yeah, I guess Andy might know more details, but uh, a lot of the video systems produce a signal to synchronize. And so uh, you, you can basically record it on uh, multiple channels and keep it synchronized too. Okay. So if there, if you're recording like a timestamp while you're uh, recording, then you can use the timestamp to synchronize it automatically. Uh, I, I remember years back, on several projects I did, I had the engineering team build my own custom recording deck that fit in a little Pelican case. And I could basically record four channels of audio and videos fully synchronized. So I I could record stuff in an OR at a multiple position that come back and watch it and everything stayed together rather than having odd movements on the screen. That would be really valuable. I think rather than having to start both videos and stop both videos at the same time, having something like that would make a big difference. 
I'll try to send you some of that information, Alex. Uh, that is the time code is the simple way of doing it. And uh, you can get fancier like the, um, the CCVI folks, uh, Dimitri uh, Levy, Levin. Um, if you have other data that you're recording, uh, you can uh, sync other types of data, you know, pressure gauges, all that kind of stuff. Um, I can try to get some of that info to you. Yeah, because especially if you're using it in a simulated environment, then you want to also record the data from the patient monitor so it stays synchronized and see how the actions are effect, affecting the state of the patient at the same time. That's a good point. Does the, anyone in the group have, so our next step is to bring someone that's either computer engineering or app development. Does anyone have recommendations for anyone that might be good for this job or where to look? I guess, I don't know if Andy wants South to Lake Union and throw a stone, you'll hit somebody probably who can do it. Yeah, I think, you know, one thing is the video setup and the video is already done and we don't have a dedicated video of the monitor. And those are all things to consider for the next round, what we have right now. But and, and, and it's OK for this one because we know exactly how the vital signs respond based on their intervention because it was so tightly designed. Um, but I think the other question is like, what is the useful data we want to code for, right? So so whatever, we figure out how to synchronize these two. We get our, our screen record and the video of the participant side by side. What are the most relevant questions to ask about this interface between technology and patient care? And I think that's um, probably the big question. This, um, how to get that data, but then then what are we even asking? Yeah, I guess it, it, in a way, it, if you were using uh, the standardized patients, then you could also ask the patient how they were feeling about their interaction with the learner, but with the mannequin, we, we'd have to put a lot of thought into what we would capture from the interaction that would give us a hint that there, there's more of a connection between patient and provider. Is there a plan to look at consequential evidence as far as, you know, actually getting this into the hands of, you know, next July's interns and, and seeing how they, how they do and can you establish a, you know, baseline data around time, the, 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 me the metrics you're looking at, and then see if this, you know, impacts that, uh, makes it less. You mean like in real life patient? Yeah. I mean, if you, stat, if you know, you probably can sort out time, you know, you know, when time to code is, this is all, it's all documented when things are administered um, and everything. So we can, might have that data and maybe spend now collecting that time, that data baseline. And then with the, with the new class, but you'd have to look at specifically that where the interns are, are there. And that's the other problem. It's a team, right? Like you're saying, so it won't, they may not be there alone. Um, so there'll be influence from the team, which makes that, that makes it a little challenging actually. Yeah, but from the patient's pers perspective, they couldn't care less if it was just the resident that did it or if the team did it. So from the system perspective, the question is, are we helping the patients faster or not, period? It, it, but then you'd want to give this, have access to everyone and, and the more senior folks answering know these things like the back of their hand. It's not, they probably won't need it. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. So well, they'll, they'll, it'd be hard to do a study like that because they'll be influencing what's actually happening. Um, don't you think, or maybe not? Will the intern be they're the first there? It's usually a nurse. I think you're right. I think it's usually if a rapid, we're going to have documentation if a rapid response nurse is called. The rapid response mm -hmm. nurses are experts in drugs, the doses, all mm -hmm. of those things. Um, 
especially if an intern responds either with someone else, like an attending or resident, or they're kind of just deferring to the nurse. And there are times where they're going to be alone, which is where this app would be most helpful, but then we want up the documentation. Yeah. It, um, it's tough to isolate the impact of just training that one person. Like you'd need to, yeah. The other part that would be tricky is we probably wouldn't have access to knowing when the rapid response occurs until they kind of do their data collection Q quarter, mm -hmm. and then it might be too late to even know if they yeah. use that application or not. I mean, I think it's one of the big limitations here, right? It's these interns are not operating in isolation, but I think right. to, till they get to the point of activating a rapid response, right? So they're called for a rapid heart rate or um, someone has a clinical decompensation, but no one has activated in our uh, rapid mm -hmm. response yet. This is where it may really help them and nursing, right? I mean, nursing mm -hmm. can use this. It, this is, um, and then that might get them to escalating that care faster. And in the meantime, operating with a little bit more confidence in what, what their role right. is. And I know that is a goal of the institution is to get from what you just described, early activation rather than delayed. Is that something you think could be measured? Potentially. Yeah, I mean, actually it could be because usually there's a page that goes out or a, um epic chat that goes out and then we know what time the rap response was called. Mm -hmm. So if, if there would be a way to get that list of the rap responses called, the page time, which could be findable, but within a time period that we could then go back and ask the learner, did you actually use the application? Um, and did that influence how you proceeded. Um, it'd be hard to know, like, did they just pop it open? Did they look at the right page of the application? They probably wouldn't yeah. remember that after the fact, but maybe if there was some pre-teaching on, hey, we're doing this study, um, then it might be easier to capture that. The one thing I was thinking is I almost wonder if the emergency department is a better place because you might have people, well, I guess attendings are pretty much going in when someone's sick, but um, things happen a lot quicker and maybe in more discrete time periods. The problem is we don't have activation of rapid responses or code blues. So you wouldn't have that outcome data as far as escalation. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's a good point though. I think there there probably is some way to look at it in real time. Um, because we do keep we keep all the information on what time the rapid responses are called, what the outcome was, if the person was escalated. Even just looking at was the person appropriately escalated. And was the app used might be an uh, interesting question. It's like, can you take a, an, a rapid response activation and backtrack when um, nursing first alerted a team member or, or something and figure out that time difference? The one thing is the, the residents are already using this app quite a bit. So it's not new, but there's a new group and they might not always use it. So there is going to be a comparison and control. You know what, but Liza, you're saying, I mean, maybe using this for the nurses as your target because they are usually there first yeah that's true i wonder if i mean if having them be your target learning audience maybe you can impact that all important metric of time to activation that's true yeah because a lot of our application is at this point, you should be calling a rapid response. Um, mm -hmm. That's a good point. And it, you would have a little bit more control because they're definitely not using it now. So you could potentially maybe have one unit say, hey, take a look at this app. <laughs> Let's train you in it. Um, and then not do that broadly. And then the other, on the other side is the metric of how many times was it? I don't know if, if there's ever such thing as an inappropriate activation. Do you, do you think that there is? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's ones where they show up and say, all right, we don't need this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe you can, maybe those would increase, but then again, maybe they would decrease because, or, you know, I don't know. That's a really good point. So <laughs> my, From a my, user, resource utilization, that would be really important. I think, you know, I, I, we always err on the side of you know being oversensitive and, and calling these things um, and not penalizing people if they were, you know, uncomfortable or needed help. I think that the... the um, problem is, I, I, by the way the app is designed, um, they're using it, if it's relevant, it's going to get them to call our, a rapid response, right? If if it's not relevant, I'm not even sure where we'll end up in the app, but um, unless there was a pathway added to like low acuity pathway, but I don't know what that would look like. Right. 
Yeah, I was going to ask almost a similar question. Why do we need to then uh, create a modified app that is more appropriate to the decision-making process of the nurses rather than the residents? I think this could be applicable to them. Um, I'd have to look through again and see if there's, I mean, there may be things that just aren't like maybe the, they won't be interpreting the EKGs, but it's pretty streamlined. And we really did avoid, avoid that next steps and more nuanced management. So just things like check the airway, breathing circulation, call, rapid response, consider calling anesthesia. So I think it actually would work. And I, I intended it, that it could be used by the nurses. I just don't think they really use it, um, but I think it, it could work. Alex, thanks for presenting. Any, uh, wrap. Sorry, go ahead. I, I just had a quick question. Uh, did you notice any reluctance or hesitancy by a user who uh, wasn't very comfortable using the tool? Not not in terms of understanding how it's used, but but making that jump to this is maybe information I should know, and and I should rely on my recall versus I'm going to use this powerful tool, helpful tool. Uh, but it's it's also showing that I don't know the information. And on the flip side, from the patient perspective, I don't know how often these sort of tools are used at, at a bedside, let's say, and and what that might look like from a patient thinking, you know, the comfort of a, a doctor and, and care coming, but also relying on uh, a phone, which unfortunately we equate with, you know, uh, distraction or uh, ill-informed, you're looking something up, but they're using this to to reaffirm a, a, an action they're about to do. But I'm just wondering about that. And and I know that that's down the line with real patients and not a simulated environment, but it's it's akin to the conversation about bringing goggles into uh, a patient's room. Uh, if you're not used to it, you, you're relying on your old uh, ideas of of what people are doing on a cell phone and not that it's a, it's a tool that's going to improve their care. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, for your first question, was there reluctance? It actually was interesting. Um, we had a couple learners, um, Liza, don't be mad about this, uh, a couple EM learners that I think probably did know more at baseline than some of the other residents. And there was one resident that had done a previous residency, so had some baseline knowledge. Um, but they, they were clearly reluctant to use the app. You could tell they were just like, I know this, I, especially for the epinephrine portion. They were like, I know this, I don't need to use the app. And then one of them dosed at IV and didn't check the app. And that was one of the ones that never navigated to it. Um, and I noticed some that there was this reluctance until they started to sense that, wait a second, I don't know all the pieces of information and then went into it. But I do think it's true that someone maybe in that medium knowledge stage that feels like they should know things, doesn't really want to signal to other people that they're checking and there may even be some things in the app that seem basic and kind of trigger them to feel like this is below their level. Um, our goal was that that drugs doses section takes out those other parts that may seem below their level. Um, but I, I did notice that there was a couple of people that just did not want to use it. And one of the people that didn't correctly navigate to the area was pretty mad after the simulation was like, you need to fix this app, it's no good. Um, so I think when it didn't work, it, it was pretty frustrating. Um, and then your second question was about, oh, the patient interaction with the application. I think that's definitely true. I mean, all the time now when I'm rounding with residents, we're pulling out phones and pulling up their labs. And I know they're thinking, are you just texting right now when I'm acutely sick? Um, but I think about like, I'm sure a lot of people had the same experience when I was a resident you know, four or five years ago, I was turning around and looking at a computer screen, which was probably even worse. And not only was I directing my attention to another resource, showing my lack of knowledge, but then I was also turning away from the patient. Um, so I know with my learners, I'm always saying, tell the patient, hey, listen, I'm going to double check this and make sure that we're doing the right action. Um, but I do think that it has the potential. I think it's the potential to make patients uncomfortable, but I think realistically we're all reaching for stuff all the time and the less time we can spend on it, the easier it is to get to that information, probably the better for care and then the better for how the patients perceive their care. Well, this is a wonderful project, Alex and, and Liza and Vic. Um, congratulations. And I mean, one of the things two years ago when we had our first um, symposium is there's a lot of interest in app development and having that capability, as you pointed out, you asked who 
who could do that, I think is a missing piece here at, at, uh, within our division and, and having that capability here. Um, I think we would keep them quite busy with ideas, um, and, and development and have sort of a, a pretty robust pipeline of, of, uh, very, very useful products that could get, uh, created combination of, uh, the people in this, in this group with that, with their capabilities. So again, I mean, <laughs> it's sort of a, a call for, for that capability to be brought in. But look out, I mean, there's a lot of people who can do this kind of work around, especially in this community. I wish we had someone here. We don't. Well, thanks so much. I yeah. really appreciate this opportunity. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank Have a good evening. Great oh, job, Alex. Next, next month, uh, Taylor Sawyer, uh, January 9th.